podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Is it really a moral hazard to help the little guy? I don't think so. I mean, I appreciate that there are probably two distinct groups of people here, but what we've been seeing over the last couple of years as we try to figure out how to mitigate the crisis is that there's no good policy decision that anybody's been able to put forward that helps us to distinguish between the two groups. And given that there is such a large group of people who were placed into loans that they couldn't afford by unscrupulous brokers, and you know these were folks, the folks that we generally help are lower income, um, and so not necessarily financially very savvy. Um, they just didn't understand what they were getting into, and a lot of the brokers were looking to make money. And the more expensive the loan was, the more money the broker made. Um, and so we're just seeing a lot of people who are three years, four years into making their loan payments and are going to a housing counselor or are coming to us. And as we explain the terms of their loans, you know, this is an adjustable rate loan, this is a negatively amortizing loan, this loan has a huge balloon payment, these people have no idea sometimes, often times, that their loans contain those type of terms. And they've been making payments for years. Um, and so I just have a very hard time saying, uh, let's just take a position of not helping anybody because some people knew what they were doing. There were so many people who didn't, and a lot of those people were lower income borrowers who stand to lose everything if they lose their homes. They place their life savings into these places and without their homes, without the assistance that some of these programs provide, I don't, ba very bad things happen. You know, government money is coming in to help distressed homeowners, coming yeah. right into North Carolina, over $100 million. I think it's actually $484 it four? million. It's and a lot of money. And uh, 151, I know up in Forsyth County they're working that. With, it's called the hardest hit mm -hmm. counties, and, 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 they're, and they're working it. The philosophy behind using your tax dollar, my tax dollar, to help someone who got in over their head financially. Are we talking helping society as a whole, or are we talking being simply compassionate to one individual person using tax dollars? Well, I think it, it fits both. I mean, both of those sort of paradigms that you've set up. Certainly, the hardest hit money is going to help people stay in their homes. It's going to help maintain individual households, keep kids in the same schools, sort of mitigate upheaval. Um, but it also does a lot for the community as a whole to keep these folks in their houses. When a house is foreclosed on, it lowers the property values of the surrounding, the surrounding homes, um, particularly if that house ends up staying vacant for a while, which is happening a lot. Um, most of these houses are being bought at foreclosure auctions by the banks, and the banks are very intelligently, I think, sort of holding back on their stock. They don't want to release all the foreclosed properties into the market at once. It lowers the value. Um, and so we're seeing boarded up houses bringing down the value in communities. Property taxes are coming down, so that means that um, municipalities yeah. are taking in less money. Um, I think that there's a lot of benefit to trying to keep homeowners in their homes, get them to an affordable payment, or with the hardest hit money, a lot of that is just going to offer temporary payments on behalf of borrowers so that they can stay while they get new jobs or are trained to do different jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and it just it just makes it better for the entire community. There's just no question in my mind about that at all. Is the lesson learned or the lesson missed if at the sign of trouble someone can come to an attorney like yourself and get a bailout? Perhaps if at a sign of trouble things could just get fixed, I have yet to see that. Right. Um, people are so anxious, so distressed, so confused, and and you know, I get phone calls from my clients repeatedly because they just are so afraid and it takes so long to fix a problem if there's a problem or to assist somebody with a modification. You know, the, I, I'm sure you all have heard this before. You, know, you can apply for a modification with your loan servicer. You can do everything that they ask you to do, send in all the paperwork that they want, and you call to follow up or I call to follow up on behalf of my borrowers. And the paperwork's gone, and we start over again. And for some of these people, it means that they never get a modification because their income sure. has improved in the amount of time it's taken the bank to lose their paperwork several times. Um, you know, none of this is easy. 
all of it takes a lot of work, a lot of stress, and a lot of concern on the part of borrowers. Can you separate the emotion of this, seeing someone sitting there going, uh-oh, I am underwater, I'm going to lose my home. Can you separate the emotion of that from what's good for the market, what's good for the economy? Can it, I personally or can anyone? <laughs> well, there are two sides of this issue. Can you personally? I mean, like I've already said, yeah, I think sure. that they go together. So I mean, I think emotion, that there's everything goes together for you. Yeah, I think that there is obvious benefit to the individual borrower if we can find a way to keep them in the home, and there's benefit to the community as a whole and to the state as a whole. What do you make of the neighbor next door to the person who's seeking this kind of help, and they're going, "Wow, I've I've cut back my personal spending. I'm cutting everything to save my house, and this person is seeking help, and they're getting it. And where's mine?" I think that the benefit, particularly mm. to the immediate next door neighbor, of not having a foreclosed property is enormous. I, I mean, there's just, it's very difficult to sell your home when the house next door is boarded up. It, it's scary. It, and what you're seeing is, by helping an individual, you're seeing an entire community, entire neighborhoods being preserved, at least from a property value standpoint? From a property value standpoint, from a safety standpoint, you know, having a vacant property next door is... It, it, it's a danger. It's a danger to the community. People break into them. They steal the copper out of the crawl space, mm -hmm. out of the walls. I mean, there, there's just, I've seen it, you know, in, in my own neighborhood and with my clients who've been evicted or removed from their homes, you know, who are trying mm -hmm. to get them back. Um, the break-ins are common with vacant lots or is, with vacant properties. Is there a time you stop this theoretical debate in the policy circles and say, this is what it is and no matter how many policy papers you may publish, it doesn't apply in the real world, it's not practical? I think it's a, I mean, it's a, it is a very complicated issue and I think that the circumstances obviously vary from borrower to borrower. Um, the best that we've been able to do at this point is to say, you know, we're helping people who are living in a primary residence. You know, we're not mm -hmm. offering modifications. This new hardest hit money isn't gonna be helping people with second homes or investment properties. Um, we're really looking at preserving communities. We're looking at preserving individual families or individual people in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the only way to, to move out of the theoretical circle and into the sort of is this working in the real world is to say, yeah, I mean, we're preserving communities. There are mm -hmm. certainly instances where foreclosure, it happens, and there's no way to stop it, and there may not be an appropriate way to stop it. Will lessons get learned by this? Are you, seeing, are you seeing people who are saying, okay, I won't make this mistake again, or are you seeing people who go, ha-ha, got away with it, I get to stay in my house? Nobody I have worked with has said, ha-ha, I've gotten away with it. I mean, nobody's getting a free house. Nobody's getting away with more than they should, I mm -hmm. think. You know, there is no principal reduction that's happening. We wish that it were. Um, you know, it's, it's less important, I think, in North Carolina than in some of the places where the housing bubble just property values deflated so fast when it popped. Um, but what we're just seeing is usually moderate reductions in the interest rate. And that's, I mean, you could complain about it and maybe feel angry that your neighbor got an interest rate reduction. But all that that's doing is reducing the amount of money that the bank is making on the property. It's not reducing the amount of money that the people borrowed or the amount that they're paying back, at least for prince, from a principal perspective. What we're also seeing a lot of times is a reamortization of the loan, which means they're recalculating for how many years a borrower is going to have to make payments. So it just means they're not going to own their home in 30 years, they're going to own it in 40. Um, sometimes we're seeing balloon payments placed at the end of the loan and hope that 30 years from now they'll be able to be in a financial position where they can refinance. So the $20,000 they owe 30 years from now, they'll be able to get a new loan for that $20,000 and, and pay that off. But we're seeing essentially deferred payments. We're not seeing people paying less than what their property is worth. And again, I, I mean, the high interest rates were often a result of unscrupulous brokers selling loans, of banks asking the brokers to sell these kind of loans. You know, there was greed. We can focus on the greed of the home buyer, but again, I think that that was limited and they were talking, the home buyers were talking to experts who were thinking, these property values are going up and up and up and up and they're gonna just keep going up and up and up and up forever. So I can sell you a scary, you know, exploding arm loan that's gonna cost you 
potentially $1,400 in two years where it's $900 now, but it'll be okay because you can refinance because your property is going to be worth more and with more equity, you'll qualify for a better loan. I mean, there was a lot, a lot of that. And so the greed was not coming only from home buyers. And some of it, I mean, some of these home buyers were not greedy at all. They were excited. I, was, I can get my first home. A broker's telling me I can afford it. Um, and, and I'm excited. And the banks were really pushing these bad loans. And so the greed's coming from both sides. And from what I can tell, the banks haven't learned much. <laughs> um, home buyers, I'm hopeful, have learned to be cautious. I don't think my clients necessarily have learned a lot more about being savvy as far as like what the terms of a loan are, were they to ever be able to take out a new loan, I think they have learned to be a little bit gun shy. And hopefully, you know, the experience will encourage them to talk with an attorney or some expert who's kind of neutral in the process before they ever do something like this again.